Thank you. Hello, everyone. How are you today? You well? You good? Yes. It's a good day. It's a good day. It is. You know, the Bible says, um, this is a day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. It's a posture of decision to say, I will be joyful and happy because God made today. It's amazing. So let's get our, into our preaching series, Miracles. Jesus makes the impossible possible. Uh, a quick overview um, before we get into what I've been given to uh, sift through and bring to yourselves today. Everyone wants a miracle, but nobody wants to be in a situation that necessitates one. You can't have one and not the other. Only God can perform miracles, but nearly every miracle has a human element. Mark has been challenging us over the past weeks over believing in the impossible through Jesus. And today, I'm tasked with breaking down scripture uh, for us to understand about Jesus as he deals with the nobleman. And we're going to go over to uh, John chapter 4, verses 46 to 54. So we can turn our Bibles there. We're not going to read it just yet, but I want to give you a bit of an intro into uh, where this story um, is in the journey of Jesus. So Jesus leaves Judea and journeys towards Cana. He passes through Samaria and meets the woman by the well. He tells her he is the living water. Drink and you'll never thirst again. According to Jews, Samaritans were considered worse than enemies. Jesus supplies the need of a Samaritan woman who was considered an outcast. Her status was very low in her society. Jesus stays for two more days speaking the truth to them all. He then sets out on his journey to return to Cana in Galilee. You can imagine Jesus entering the city, can't you? The crowds of admirers. That's the man who turned the water into wine. That's the man who stopped the embarrassment happening to that young couple. All the people who attended the wedding feast must have had their eyes set on Jesus. Jesus is returning, the miracle worker. So there's a noble man in Capernaum who heard that Jesus is returning to Cana and thought, I need to go and have an audience with Jesus. So we're going to pick up in the story of when Jesus now enters Cana. So he came again, verse 46, to Cana in Galilee, where he had made the water wine. And at Capernaum, there was an official or nobleman, as some translations say, whose son was ill. When this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to ask him and asked him, come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So Jesus said to him, unless you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The official said to him, sir, come down before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. As he was going down, his servants met him and told him that his son was recovering. So he asked them the hour when he began to get better. And they said to him, yesterday, at the seventh hour, the fever left him. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus had said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. This was now the second sign that Jesus did when he came from Judea to Galilee. The first thing I want to express to you when I was reading this, the first thing that came to me that really hit me was that it's not about your status, but it's about your submission. Look in John 4, 47, it says, when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. This nobleman in scripture could be one of three types. He could be descended from a king, one, one belonging to the courts, or a soldier of the king. Whichever sense we understand that the nobleman was in the courts of the king. He was somebody of high status. This person, therefore, was uh, part of Herod's um, um, courts. Herod ruled over Galilee at the time in Persia. He most likely had access to the finest medicinal processes and physicians available in Galilee. 
knowing the king or being in the king's courts, I'm sure he could just ask or send a word and find the best physicians in Galilee. And we see in verse 51, he was going down to his servants. So his servants came to meet him halfway. So this was a man who had servants. He had status. He had notoriety. He was well-respected. But Jesus doesn't respond to his status. See, in the West, in our society, it's based on status, isn't it? We're governed by it. It's almost this invisible law that we all live by. It's too expensive for you to own. You don't have enough qualifications. You're unpopular. Who do you know? Why should you be helped? What can you offer us? We're governed by status. And I can almost imagine this nobleman who's come from the courts of the king had this invisible law of status around him. People listen to him. When he sends for something, he receives it. But Jesus responds to your submission, not to your status, whether poor or rich. It's irrelevant to the Lord. It's submission. The biblical uses for submission, which I found quite beautiful, is a voluntary attitude of giving in. I love that. You still have options, but you choose to lay it down and give in. So whether you're poor or rich, you can meet with Jesus. We just need to submit. Outcast or celebrated, Jesus can show you his great working power. We just need to submit. Voluntary giving. The nobleman heard that Jesus was in Cana and went to him. So verse 47 we find, when this man heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. So as you can see on the image here, yeah, Capernaum to Cana, it's about 20 miles. So probably a full day's journey that the nobleman traveled to meet Jesus. And when he arrived, he probably was on a time scale of, hey, you know, let's go. Come and see my situation. Come and see my struggle. It's another day's journey back, and my son might not make it. Surely, on his journey down, there was enough time to fret, to be anxious and troubled of the time away from his son. There was a time when my daughter was in hospital for four days due to a surgery. And I remember each day we had to leave to go to the local um, place where we were staying. And every time we went, we, you, you could almost hear the thoughts go through our minds. The worry, the anxiety. Is she, will she be okay? She's with strangers. And all of this happened over the four days. So I can imagine that when the nobleman traveled from Capernaum down to Cana, there was plenty of time to be anxious, plenty of time to be troubled. But nonetheless, he went to Jesus. He left the king's courts. He left the king's physicians. He left the king's atmosphere and went to Jesus in Cana. Did you know that Jesus welcomes you too? The question is, do you attend the appointment? You are not qualified for miracles because of your status. You are qualified by your submission. Do you submit to the power of Jesus? The nobleman went, do we go to Jesus? And just so you know that I'm not just talking of my own opinion. Oh, Charles is having an opinion there. No, this is scripture. This is a, a, a pattern, a thread that we see in scripture. Submission before a miracle. For instance, Mary says to the servant at the wedding in Cana, do whatever he tells you. So submit to whatever Jesus tells you. They could have been embarrassed if they listened. The young boy needed to give up five loaves and two fishes. Oh, this is my lunch. How am I going to eat? But he must have had some of what was made for the 5,000 with plenty to leave, left, leave over. And he could have brought home some for his parents if he wanted to. He sacrificed. How about Moses? Raise up your rod and the seas will part. And the Egyptians, I can see the dust. They're coming to kill us. Sacrifice. And think salvation. We submit to Jesus in trust and confession, and then we are regenerated. It comes from 
submission. We lay down our arms. We lay down our, our power. We lay down our influence. We lay down our qualifications. We lay down our poverty. We lay down our riches and say, here we are, Jesus. Give me your power. We are regenerated through his Holy Spirit when we submit to the truth of his gospel. I want to give you a personal experience here for me. Yeah. So in my own life, I like to be, I'm quite an open man. I like to share with others what goes on and what God has done. So we're in the process in 2018 of getting our first shop. I was at home and we needed to leave. We had 18 months. We had only been there for 18 months and we were gutted when we found out that we had to leave. 18 months. Finally, we've been, we're here. I said to my wife, we can do this now. And they said, we're knocking this building down. Wow, our investment has not paid off. We didn't know what to do. We had no savings. We had no uh, parents. We could say, hey, could you give us some? My dad had already given me money to start the shop. So I'm thinking to myself, how am I going to navigate this? How are we going to navigate this, me and my wife? So we submitted to God in lifestyle and in prayer, and we gave it to him. We said, Lord, we don't know what's going to happen, but we give you our situation and submit to your power. So our landlord called us in for a meeting to give us this severance package. And he said to us, all right, Mr. Celestin, you're in band D. That means the lowest band because you're a recent tenant. It was gutted. Band D means we're going to get about 400 to 500 pounds. Not a lot. It's not even a month's rent there. However, in a change of moment, it was, it was remarkable. He sat there, looked in my eyes and said, band D. And then he says, however... I'm going to bump you up to band A. <laughs> Sorry? I was so confused. And he says, no, band A, you get £5,000 to early exit your contract. I couldn't believe it. I snapped that up straight away. I said, thank you, God. <laughs> we so needed that. <laughs> and we went to go and look for a property locally in Plasto. We paid our three months deposit. And we fitted the shop, and it was enough for us to get everything we needed to start that journey. And we've been here for five years by God's grace. God is great, isn't he? When you put your trust and faith in Jesus, you will never be put to shame. When we submit under the mighty hand of God, he moves in our life. But the question is, do you discount yourself from a miracle from God? Did the doctor say you can't be healed. Has a friend whispered, it is impossible? Does the world scream, you don't deserve it? And perhaps your own mind chuckles like Sarah's. It's too difficult. I'm here to tell you, nothing is too difficult for Jesus. Just lay down your power. Lay down your qualifications. Lay down your intellect at the feet of Jesus and watch him transform your world. He is great and he is good. I want to tell you that Jesus knows. He's so loving. He's so kind. He knows. John 4, 49, as we've been reading that story, the official said to him, Sir, come down before my child dies. Man, I mean... See my daughter go into the, 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 the operating theater. Whew. Yeah, I mean, you can feel the pressure in that moment of going, oh, Jesus, I mean, I need you right now. The pressure of, listen, I, I don't really need an oracle of a word. I need you to move right now. But Jesus came and says, I know, I understand. The man was demanding. He was desperate for his own way. Something he may have been used to with his servants. Fetch me a pail of water and they will bring him a pail. I don't know why I said pail. I should have said a pail. I think I've got the poem in my head. <laughs> Fetch me a glass of water. Pail. Fetch me a glass of water. <laughs> and he went and they will go and grab whatever he needed. He wanted Jesus to come and see his situation. Come, I want you to see how sick my son is. This fever has gripped him to the point of death. Come and see how desperate my situation is. The man said, come down. But Jesus responds in verse 50 and he says, go, your son 
will live. See, we can't ring fence Jesus in. Mm -mm. Jesus wants to destroy the ring fence on our minds. It's not impossible for him, but we have sometimes a limited view of God's power, a limited view of what he can do. And he wants to say, let me break that ring fence on your mind and show you what I can do. Go, your son will live. Distance is no issue for God. Amen? It doesn't matter if your family member is in another country and you're praying for them. They can be healed. Why? Because distance is no issue for the God who is everywhere all at once. So we know that God can make impossibles possible. Oh, wonderful word of God. So take comfort. Do you know that Jesus knows your struggle in your heart? Maybe something you haven't shared with anyone. He knows your need. He knows your shortcomings. And he's seen your tears. He already knows. We just need to submit to the Savior's gentle words and belief. Oh, God is good. God is so, so good. So that's the first part I wanted to explain to you about submitting to God. Submitting to his power so his power can flow. It's normally in the pride of our hearts where that resistance comes and we don't see the miracle manifest. But when we submit our intellect, when we submit our wisdom, when we submit those things we hold onto, the boat, we don't get out and walk in water. Because the boat is keeping us ring fenced in. It's too deep. We may sink. Ah, physics say, Jesus says, come. We must believe. We must trust. So the question is, submitting to God's power, I understand that in theory, but I don't understand that in practice. What does that look like in practice? Well, first of all, we have to understand why miracles? Why does God bring miracles in our life. The purpose of miracles, friends of God, is to reveal God's glory, his nature, what he is like. That's the purpose of miracles. So he can show you who he is, how much he cares and loves you, what he is like, the nature of God, his glory. The distance was important in this miracle. It was for Jesus to show that he is God, and that he is omnipresent. That means everywhere at once. His power is not restricted by walls or distance. And that's not just necessarily physical distance. That's also intellectual distance, emotional distance. It is not um, restricted or held back. Jesus wants to show us the Father and the Son's glory of omnipresence. Go, your Son will live. It's amazing, isn't it? He came 20, 20 miles, a full day's journey, and Jesus turned and said to him, go, your son will live. John 2, 11 says, this beginning of the signs, of his signs, Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory and his disciples believed in him. Hmm. When we see the glory of God, Faith is aroused. What did they believe? His word. So what do we submit to? God's word. That's where we submit to his word. His word that's forever settled in heaven. His word that sanctifies us. His word that cleans us out. His word that's our foundation in which we stand on. We submit to his word. The nobleman submitted to Jesus' word. All we need is the word of God, his word to believe. And the nobleman showed that Jesus' word was enough. You see, the miracle happens because God's word has spoken. That's how powerful his word is. Go, your son will live. That's all he said to him. The son was healed before the nobleman believed. 
Look, John 4, 50, let's read it. Jesus said to him, go, your son will believe, your son will live. The man believed the word that Jesus spoke to him and went on his way. So when Jesus spoke the word, the boy was already healed and then he believed. That's the power of God's word. And it's, and it's strange because when I was going over this again, I was like, Lord, why is the battle of your word such a huge one for your people? Go, it's free. There's no subscription plan. There's no, oh, I can't afford that. It's, it's sitting on our shelf or table or bedside table. It's right there. We can just read it. Why don't we? Why do we find it boring or, or I don't understand it? Why do we? Why is there such a battle there? Because it's the home of God's promises. See, if the enemy, if the enemy lets you understand the power of God's promises, you're going to live a life free from the chains and the restrictions of life. Yeah, you're going to walk in the miracles of God because his word is a lamp to your feet and a light to your path. You're going to see God move. The nobleman went on his way. He believed in the word in which Jesus spoke. He didn't throw a bunch of questions, although questions aren't wrong as we learned with Doubt and Thomas. He just believed. He didn't overthink and become anxious. He just believed. And it's not because Jesus spoke words, it's because it was Jesus who spoke the word. And we too have the Bible, the word of God, the promises of God. And you can choose today to dive in and make those promises yours by the power of the Holy Spirit and live out these miracles for God and see it happen. Why? Because in Romans 10, 17, it tells us, faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Faith is aroused through the word of Christ. So what do you think we should be doing as children of God is arousing our faith by hearing the word of God. You can make that change today. You can change your Sunday routine and go home and decide to open up scripture and read through it and find the promises of God for the challenges in your life and see God bring a great miracle through. You just need to submit. Submit to his wonderful word. There is great power in the word of God. And we can unlock that when we submit. Faith aroused by God's word. The question is, though, do you trust God's word? Do you believe it brings out miracles? The word of God is enough to give you faith for miracles. In the early 2000s, um, you saw the big move of these televangelists going out, saying, put your hand towards the screen, submit a thousand pounds, and you will be healed of this very thing. We saw a big move of that. I remember um, when I was young, my mom got this thing called Christian Cable. It was amazing. Christian Cable, there's about 40 channels on there. And literally, I think every channel, other than one kid's channel, was all about these televangelists preaching and saying, you can be healed. And I remember my mom and my dad, Morris Carrillo, these people and so forth. It was absolutely, like, literally, it was like revival fever. That's what my mom kind of like, that was her faith era. I remember as a kid watching that thinking... So I, I, can, I can get a miracle from God if I put my hands toward the TV. But I didn't know the word. The word reset me. And I realized that the miracle comes from a relationship with Jesus Christ. It flows from him. It says, it says in the scriptures, those who believe in Jesus, as the scriptures, it says, out from their innermost being will flow rivers of living water. And those rivers of living water are healing rivers of water. It's the Holy Spirit. It comes from relationship with Jesus So what will you do if you struggle? Will you submit and believe? Or will you resist and lack faith? Friends, I want to challenge you today to arouse your faith with God's great word. Trust in it. Like you're trusting in that chair that's holding you now. You didn't question it, did you? You knew the chair was going to hold you. Why? Because you have repeated the sitting process. So you understand the chair is going to hold you. Now, if you repeat the reading process of God's word time and time again and trusting in his word, you'll realize that this holds me. This keeps me in a storm. 
in the hard and challenging moments of life, and they will come, his word will keep you firm and secure. He spoke light into existence. Let there be light. Words. He can speak light into your darkness. Your prayers will pack a hundred punches because of God's word and truth living in you. Heaven will shake and miracles will happen because his word has been spoken. It's amazing. My mom always sends me this, um, this uh, message on WhatsApp. And she says, our son, I just want to remind you uh, of uh, a scripture in Isaiah. It speaks about as the rain falls to the ground and waters the earth and doesn't return, so his word is the same. God's word does not return back to where it came from until it's accomplished what it's been sent to do. So can you imagine you hold to the promises of God and you say, well, God, you said this. Well, what does it have to do? It has to complete what it's been sent to do. Healing is yours. He is the Lord that heals us. So, Lord, heal us. It, it's, it's A, B, C. It's not hard. We just need to submit to what he says. Although we may see these things and challenges around us, like Peter with the waves, we must stay fixed on Jesus, the truth in which he said, and we will see the miracle happen. I truly believe it because it's happening in my life right now. The challenge is in my life right now. It's been in my life before. And it's only been the word that's kept me firm. That's kept my family firm. Heaven shakes when we trust wholly in the word of God. And a noble man didn't have perfect faith. He didn't have perfect faith. But what he had, he gave to Jesus. And that's your encouragement today. It's your measure of faith is different for each person. But what you have, box it up in its complete entirety and then give that to Jesus. And if it's 5%, God will make up the rest. If it's 15%, God will make up the rest. But give it all to him and trust that he loves you and he cares for you and he will bring about a miracle in your life. Just let go. I don't want to say let God because that's a, that's a, that's a phrase that is always said so much. And I really don't like that phrase, but let go and let God. Yeah, I... <laughs> I have to say it because I can't think of anything else, but you understand what I'm trying to say. It's all about your heart posture. It's all about your heart posture. Is your heart postured to submission? John 4, 53. The father knew that was the hour when Jesus has said to him, your son will live. And he himself believed and all his household. Faith in Jesus spread to the whole household because of the faith of one. Do not underestimate the power of salvation that's in your life. Your family, see, they watch you, they hear what you say, and that effect is powerful upon them because the faith of one. God will do miracles in your life. And he's done miracles in your life. Tell him. Tell your family about the goodness of, and the greatness of what God has done. God is always in the business of the miracle of salvation. Regeneration, the word regene, your gene code is changed. You're given a new heart. And I think no one in this room knows and understands how God can give you a new heart from an old one. How does that process even happen? It's a miracle. The old man has been crucified to the cross. And now we have this new man. We are regenerated in Christ. And we now have the power over sin. How? It's a miracle. The miracle of salvation. I mean, Nicodemus, what did he say? Oh, do I enter my mom twice? Like, how am I born again? <laughs> Jesus is like... It's a miracle. <laughs> Trust in me and you will have that miracle. Lay your strength, lay your power, lay your wisdom, lay your qualifications, lay your intellect, lay your culture down at the feet of Jesus and see the glory of God shatter physical, mental, and emotional distance. God, I'm too depressed. You can't reach me. He can reach you. Lord, it's too difficult. I can't, you can't, you can't get me where I am. I've sinned too much. He can reach you. Distance is nothing for Jesus. Ain't that amazing? Who else can we call upon? Who else can we go to to say, I can reach you wherever you are? What great resolution and understanding and dependency we can have on Jesus. And he will never let us down. Go, your son will live. And the boy lived. The fever left him. 
the fever left him. God can reach you wherever you are. Miracles can happen when we submit to God's word. We just need to submit. That's the only part that we need to do is to say, Jesus, we give up. We give in voluntarily. Do what you do and bring a miracle in my life. I'd like to conclude and welcome the band up and just bring these points home. One, status means nothing to God. He can reach you wherever you are. A nobleman's status didn't mean anything. It was to the level of submission. He went to Jesus. Miracles happen when we submit and believe in what God has promised. The scripture says, he who promised is faithful. We trust in what he has said. Submission is a voluntary, submission is a voluntary attitude of giving in. So choose to give in to God's power. Let go of your pride. Let go of the ego. Let go of these things that hold us back from seeing God move. Let go of embarrassment. What, Lord, what if it doesn't happen? Submit to his power and trust in him. Faith comes by hearing God's word. So we need to know his word. The greatest liberation of my life has come by knowing God's word. I know what he says. So I can trust and believe that his promises never fell. It's very simple. It's tough to, to grapple with because we live in a Western culture that, you know, we've got, oh, if you're feeling well, just go to the, go to the NHS and they'll help you out. Oh, ain't got money, I can loan it. We, we've got these auxiliaries that help us in our challenges. But I can imagine to people who lived in Cana, who had very little, and if you was an outcast in society, you had nothing. There was no benefit system. God's word was life to you. So I think these challenges and, and difficulties we have in our own life is that we may depend upon Jesus. The miracle happens because God's word has spoken. I want to be very candid and open with you today. I am currently in need, currently, in this right moment right here, in need of a miracle. I need God to move in my family and bring him in. But I choose to submit. I would trust his great word and I would desperately depend on Jesus to show his glory through healing. Let's pray. Lord, you say you are the Alpha and Omega. You are the beginning and you are the end. Jesus, there is nothing that happens that's outside of the scope of your power, influence. There is nothing that is a surprise to you. You knew the noble man's son was at the point of death. And Lord, just as, as you showed your power in that time, in that moment, we pray that, Lord, you will arouse our faith to see how great and wonderful our God in heaven is. That when we bring our supplications and our requests, you give us the answer of healing. When we say, Lord, can you? Is it possible? You say, yes. Because what is impossible with man is possible with God. Status means nothing, Lord. Whether we're poor or rich, it doesn't mean anything to you, Lord. You dismiss these things. Whether you're in the king's court or you're on a corner, it doesn't matter. You are the God who changes our lives when we choose to submit. So, Lord, we bring our riches, we bring our poverty, we bring our intellect, we bring our simpleness to you and lay it down and say, Lord, move. Bring about healing and transformations in our life today. Give us a heart to submit and understand what that submission is to your power. Remove pride and ego so that we can truly depend 
upon you. Because you're the God who brings healing. You're the God who brings uh, providence and change and transformation. You're the one who brings regeneration. It is you, Jesus. It is your name. It is in you, Lord. And this is where we come. This is where we bend our knees, Lord, at your great and powerful name. Father God, let the word that you have given to us dwell in us richly so we may keep faith in your promises and let your glory be seen through our lives as you bring about miracles. We believe. And where faith is small, arouse it by your word. Where faith is large, let that be shared amongst others, Lord. Let there be words of encouragement going out to others, Lord, if faith is large. Wherever we are, we know we can see miracles. If we just submit. Thank you, Lord. I, I, I chose this song specifically, um, You Deserve the Glory. It's a real uh, uh, life-giving source of praise and worship in the season that I'm going through. You deserve the glory. Really for us to change and shift our perspective to Jesus. Not on the waves or the challenges of our life, but onto Jesus. The author and finisher of our faith. Keeping our eyes fixed. So as we sing this, just take a moment in time to really think about the challenge in your life that you want to see God bring a miracle in. And shift your gaze from your, your situation to the greatness and glory of God. Amen.